I agree with this 100%. And I literally gave this example at the lunch table. I was talking to my parents like, yeah, you know, we're, right now in my community, we're talking about calling people fascists or Nazis and everybody's mad. And my mom and dad were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, but mom, the reason why we're doing it is because of people like you and you guys used to call everybody communist when I grew up. And she's like, well, I think the whole Democratic Party are communists. Really, mom? What do you think a communist is? And she's like, if the left just would stop engaging with dog whistles, then they don't work anymore, right? Imagine with the 4chan campaign, it's okay to be white. Imagine if some conservative strolls in with a shirt and he's on a college campus and everybody sees him with his it's okay to be white shirt. Nobody really cares. Nobody's looking. And he walks up and says, like, hey, what's up? Like, oh, you say Black Lives Matter? I think it's okay to be white. And somebody looks at him and they're like, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's fine to be white, dude. It's like cringe as fuck. The dude's like, okay, well, <laughs> I just want you to like, it's cringe. But instead, people see that it's okay to be a white shirt and they start fighting with the dog whistle. By definition, it's called a dog whistle because it's not accurately resembling what's being said. And when you attack the dog whistle, now you look fucking unhinged. And now you've got a whole campaign saying, it's okay to be white, that's a white supremacist slogan. Wait, how the fuck is it saying it's okay to be white? A white supremacist slogan? Well, we can say it's okay to be black, it's okay to be Asian. How does that even make sense? And now you're in, in, in a world where you're not even boxing with shadows, you're boxing with brick walls and you look crazy. Um, I listened to your conversations with Max over the past three days and saw some interesting points where I thought there could be some digging in to kind of explore some ideas. Um, I myself, I'm pretty easygoing on platforming and such. I'm kind of like, to each their own, do what you want with your platform, just try to be aware of risks and, you know, mitigate those risks as best you can. But I don't have like a very strong position on that. But I think Max made some interesting points. That, and also, I think at one point he even brought up a point that both of you missed. He like made a, a position that, or came up with a position that I think both of you missed that I'd like to dig into a bit. But I, I first want to kind of ask you, I know that recently you've talked about your platform evolving and kind of growing your audience. Mm -hmm. And you even put out a tweet, uh, maybe like a little less than a week ago, uh, or a series of tweets talking about your critics and how their viewers have been declining or flatlining, yet yours have been growing, mm -hmm. and that you've been able to branch out further. The way that you kind of painted it, it almost looked like in a way, because I know you pushed back recently that it's not just content, that this isn't just a content thing. Uh, but the way that you presented it made it look almost like you're saying, look, I'm I'm building up my platform, getting broader access to people and kind of almost downplaying what the intent is. And it makes it almost look like you're leaning into the content game. Like this is content. And um, bring up the tweets and read them. I totally disagree. I think your characterization is completely wrong. Uh, we should read the exact tweet. Uh, you purged them all. Oh, come on. I'm sure somebody took pictures. I'm sure somebody's got them. People want to submit them. Oh, fuck. Anybody have uh, screenshots of those tweets? Because you did. You showed how all your critics have declining audiences. Yeah, but my point was, and I think I said it explicitly in my first tweet, was that the bread tube method of de-radicalization failed. They, they ebbed and they flowed away. They grew really big in an era of the internet, and then all of them fettered out and failed. Um, like, like, the bread tube subreddit is dead. All the big bread tuber YouTubers are gone. Uh, the ones that are around are slowly like dying off. The idea that they were going to be the ones to reach out, speak to people on the internet, convert them away doesn't seem to be the case. And stuff like the red pill shit is like massively exploding. Like that stuff is getting really popular. So it feels like the bread tube method of going out and doing um, their thing like failed. It seemed like that method was failed. Well, and the whole reason why theirs is failing, which I agree with you on, is because they've effectively, you know, they've shored up the walls. They're not branching out more. They really only want people who already agree with them and their audiences. Yeah. Right. So largely they're just not branching out at all. And they've kind of refined their message mm -hmm. and are effectively preaching to the choir. Yeah. So, okay. So I, I think that's a, that's a good clarification. So what well, hold you on. Are oh, doing... I just, I'm pushing hard here. I want to be very sure, clear sure. throughout all this. Go for that it. wasn't a clarification. That was just me saying what I'm, what I said in my tweets. I think I said initially that BreadTube tried this method of de-radicalization and it seems like on all counts it's failed with the only exception being Hassan who's big because he clout networked like a motherfucker on Twitch, not because of anything political. I think at times you've said though that de-radicalization de isn't exactly your goal, right? What do you mean by that? That what you're trying to do is something a little bit more less defined. 
you're reaching out to people, you're kind of expanding your audience, and you are hoping that maybe some people are drawn in your direction based on your message and based on the access, on them seeing you talk to people in radical, uh, you know, in radical positions and stuff, their audiences seeing you talking to them, maybe bringing them over. But you're not, your goal isn't specifically to de-radicalize people. Um, right. True, yes. I think that having the goal specifically of de-radicalizing people, I think, is bad. I think that when you make that, like, the focus, I think that it ends up being not effective. Um, real okay. quick, let me just read this thread real quick because it got mentioned, okay? Sure. Um, so this was in regards to Merrick, um, the person with severe mental health issues who is still engaging with Twitter in an incredibly unhealthy way and isn't being stopped by anybody around her for some reason, even though she collected four or $5,000 from fans after having a mental health episode. But... My response to her was, I'm just remarking that it's unimaginably selfish of you to yoink $4,000 plus from fans and put your boyfriend through a ton of stress and trouble only for you to immediately jump back into incredibly toxic spaces and shit stare with people like me, reflect on how unbelievably selfish you are and consider finding a different hobby. As for the platforming thing, don't worry about what I'm doing. BreadTube tried the de-platforming thing and every single one of their channels have failed. Tell me who I should take notes from. And then I go through kind of like the fall off or the stagnation of all of the BreadTube channels. Um, and then my final tweet is, BreadTube rose off the backs of the choirs they preach to and failed to penetrate new audiences or keep their messaging relevant. Why would I take any advice on how to reach more people from a bunch of failed losers who obsess about canceling and deplatforming people? I think my messaging is pretty clear there, that they tried their thing, they couldn't make any new inroads with anybody else, and they all fell off and failed. Okay. But, okay, go no, Yeah, and so I kind of wanted to clarify your position what your channel is doing, what you're doing with your channel and your audience, et cetera. Um, so, all right. So I know you don't want to talk about the whole labels thing anymore, the Nazi label, right? I know you're tired of that conversation, but I, I think there are some areas that have not exactly been explored and tapped into. And I'm not asking you to call Nick Fuentes a Nazi or anybody else you have on, but I do think that there is utility in these labels, even though, yes, they're overbloated in the way that they've become used for basically anything that people happen to disagree with or find, you know, detestable. Um, okay, so, I just, I totally disagree. What do you think a Nazi is? Well, I'm, I want to pose more, like, if you don't mind me kind of exploring the idea, like, if you were to say that someone is, we're going to say pedophile, right? Mm -hmm. You the sort of things that would go on in your head as a red flag would be like, OK, I don't want to leave my children alone with this person. Right. Or if you were to say um, someone is a sexual predator, you'd be like, OK, I'm not going to accept a drink from this person. So there's utility in these labels. And what I would argue is that, and I know you said this before, that, you know, we should be pushing back on the misuses of these labels and pushing back hard but we should still be okay with using them. Otherwise they're effectively, you know, we are permissive of them being useless. And then we lose the ability to have those kinds of red flags that we can apply to people when appropriate, because they do have utility. They're a red yeah. flag for so, a reason. Yeah, Everything you're saying is, I feel like it's reinforcing why I don't like the way these words are used is because you're trying to communicate something extra. You're trying to convey some intent of the speaker or author about a person with the word rather than just saying what that thing is. And that type of miscommunication causes so much confusion because the issue that you run into is when you're trying to communicate one of those extra definitional concepts to somebody and it doesn't seem to apply when you go and you check further, well, now you're fucked. So for instance, if I say like, oh, um, who is that guy? Oh, that guy, he's like a Nazi. How do you know he's a Nazi? You know, he has a Blue Lives Matter flag or whatever. When people go and meet these people and they see, oh wait, this guy's actually like pretty friendly and doesn't think anything bad about Jews at all. Well, now you've done a weird thing where you're, you're throwing around these political labels, you're playing fast and loose with them. And then when people start to confront these other ideas and they see, well, this person doesn't match up what I think a Nazi is, you've you've neutered yourself. You've destroyed your ability to to, to convey any meaning with your words. And it feels like when you're saying this here, like if I wanted to say, you know, this person doesn't need to be around my kid, I would say this person doesn't need to be around my kid. Why would I try to shortcut that or shorthand that with labels like pedophile or whatever? Well, because then you'd end up having the conversation of, okay, well, why shouldn't I? What's wrong? And then it spirals into an extended discussion. No, that no, may actually... I reject that. It doesn't expiral into anything, and it's not an extended discussion. It's very simple. Oh, when that dude was um, 22, he was convicted for molesting a 14-year-old. Oh, easy. Boom. 
That's that's it's not long and spiraling. People are acting like all of a sudden you're going to be writing meta ethics papers to each other when you're working your master's thesis for some ethics degree in philosophy. That's not true. They're, it's very simple, very quick, and very easy. Okay, fair enough in that case. But in most cases, we do have them as a shorthand for a reason. You I can't agree hold on. Shorthanded I'm labels pushing, can be abused. I'm pushing you here. I don't think you can provide a mm -hmm. single example where the shorthand um, clarifies something rather than providing more confusion. I don't think you can ever give me an example of that. How about if you're at a party mm -hmm. and you're it's loud, it's noisy, you're there with your girlfriend and you say, oh, by the way, that person's a sexual predator. That tells it's a very easy thing to convey at that point in time where she knows instantly, OK, I'm not going to take a drink from this guy, I'm not going to be alone with them without my girlfriend there, etc. So there that is a very simple shorthand that works very well mm -hmm. in a situation where there's a lot of things contending for your attention, a lot of noise, et cetera. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, congratulations. I, I'll say that in an environment where it's noisy and loud and you're limited to like three words, okay, I'll grant you that. However, even in that circumstance, it would probably make more sense and give more clarity and be safer to say, that guy spikes drinks, <laughs> rather than saying like, that dude's a sexual predator. Again, it's still just as short, very quick, very easy. So maybe one thing that we can kind of agree on that's maybe that depending on the environment, the conditions or what it is you're trying to do, there could be utility or it could be detrimental to the conversation. How? So in the case of like, well, like what you do, you're having a conversation usually that's going to be more broken down. You're a streamer. You talk politics, you do a lot of analysis. So maybe in, in your case, it makes sense to avoid labels, except when absolutely necessary. But still, though, it's a little bit, it, it is downplaying the effectiveness of having labels for many situations that aren't like yours, where you're going to want a simpler means of communication to get a point across and have red flags available for people who know what the word means. I mean, if there's, if I, if you're literally in a time pressed situation, like I've got to defuse the bomb, who do I throw it to? And it's like, you have to say the socialist or the Nazi and they're wearing like armbands, maybe like in a time press situation where people can't hear each other very well. And you, yeah, maybe in these situations, some shorthand is okay. But in the, in the area of like political debate or when you're having any normal reasonable discussion and you're not driving by each other at like 25 miles per hour and opposite, like, I think that, I don't think that yeah. this shorthand helps anything. I think it always adds more confusion, which is why, again, even in the example that you gave where all of those conditions were met, it would be more concise and it would be more safe to say that guy spikes drinks than that guy's a sexual predator. So like, so again, I'm going to push you because people like to speak very generally on this, but I've done enough debate in these areas. Like I want specific examples. I, if you can show, because here's the thing I want to, I'm a communicator. That's my job at the end of the day. My goal is to convince people of things. I'm a communicator. I'm a debater. I'm an arguer whatever. Uh, my goal is to convince people. If you can show me like destiny, because, and I do this all the time. People email me like, Hey, if you communicate this like this, or if you say that like that, it would help you so much. And yeah, hell yeah, I'll do that. Every single time I have a conversation with somebody and political labels get involved, it always becomes mu uh, muddier. It always becomes messier. It's always yeah. more fucked. So if you can give me, I need tangible examples where you'd be like, well, Destiny, what if you were talking to somebody and you said like this? Then I'd be like, oh, um, okay, sure. Yeah, maybe that, then maybe that helps there. But almost never is it like, oh, that guy, he's a Nazi. He's a socialist. He's a sock dem even. He's a whatever. It doesn't usually help much. And if anything, I usually have to go in to clarify after that. So I actually agree with that, with what you're saying right there, because I think in most cases in your, where you're going to be communicating with people, it behooves you to be able to have a discussion more about the individual positions than to try to find a shorthand because a shorthand tends to break down conversation in most cases. In a lot of casual situations, like this is where I kind of wanted to push back though, is because of the way that in your first conversation with Max, you kind of were a little kind of 50 50 on the situation or not 50 50 but you agree that there was you know that you sometimes find utility in the labels but you prefer to not use them because you'd rather break down the positions and talk about those yeah things can and, have utility in different circumstances like calling lauren southern yeah. like nazi queen is funny but like she's probably not a queen i don't know i don't think she's a nazi, nazi barbie right now. i think they call her. Sure, Nazi Barbie, whatever, right? Like, yeah, sure, I can use it there. Or like making fun of the serfs and calling somebody a Nazi on Twitter can be like fun. But like in the context of like a serious discussion, yeah. probably not going to use these as much. But. 
Okay, I kind of wanted, that's what I kind of wanted to solidify, is just because the second conversation, it kind of broke down more, and then you were like, nah, screw it, labels are stupid, I don't ever use them, and it, like, you were more aggressively against them at that point. In the and context of, like, a serious conversation, yes. In the context of a serious conversation, yes. Okay, so, yeah, just, because I, I know that as someone who speaks out to a broader audience, I think it's good for the audience to hear and understand that, yeah, sometimes these labels are okay, especially in like certain social situations, not where you're trying to break down their positions or where you're trying to have a nuanced discussion about policy, et cetera. Um, obviously labels get kind of excessively used in many cases, even by people's own descriptions of their own positions. They'll so go and say, I'm a sock them. And next thing you know, you're, they're, you're making assumptions about their beliefs and it turns out that's not what they actually are, right? Because even they don't know their own, what their own labels imply. Um, so I agree with you on that part. Now, um, yeah, I just, I really want to kind of like solidify on what your views on labels are and I'm glad you did that. So now I better understand. So um, another thing that I wanted to kind of break down, and this is a really interesting thing that I discovered when you and Max were talking on your first conversation three days ago. Uh, Max brought up that even though people will have detestable views or like some, he even gave the example of a Nazi. Mm -hmm. he, would, he would rather have a Nazi be platformed on YouTube so they can say that they're a Nazi so we can all see it. And he was basically saying he doesn't want him deplatformed. And I thought this is an interesting paradox that he created there because what he's effectively done when he was talking about that was he was trying to say that I want their positions vetted in the public eye so we can determine that they are detestable and push back on them. But that's a paradox because the reality is that when you put something in the public eye and it gets vetted and it is seen as detestable by the population, what inevitably happens is that people end up over time, they start deplatforming people and it gets to a point where like, okay, we've all agreed society has a social conscious that has agreed that these are detestable views. And so we don't want those people represented anywhere. So we push them out and they become ostracized. And it's kind of a paradoxical position. But what's interesting about exploring that paradoxical position is that it makes me think, normally I don't like deplatforming, but it makes me think about maybe is deplatforming just inevitable as we vet these things? So like, are we circumventing society's collective wisdom by saying that we shouldn't deplatform people? Are we circumventing that? Because society's collective wisdom is generally said, you're detestable, go away. We don't want you having any kind of a spotlight. And so it was just something I wanted to kind of dig in and explore with you and see like what your thoughts are on that. I think there, I think that, I think that deplatforming is really good actually. Um, and some cultural shame is good, but it has to be reserved for the most extreme of things. So like if a guy is actually fucking kids, that dude probably needs to be removed from as many things as possible. But if a guy thinks that like blue lives matter, Trump should be the president and Hillary Clinton sold uranium to Russia or whatever, probably doesn't need to be deplatformed. We probably should be able to engage with that. There's going to be like some level of cultural shame or canceling that's important. And even conservatives will say this. Can't trans people who are teachers should be canceled or whatever bullshit, right? So like there's probably some level of like, yeah, it's probably good socially that we like don't tolerate this or that belief. That's probably okay. Uh, but we've drawn the line way, 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 way farther than we should have in my opinion right now. But if society is generally agreed that they shouldn't even have a platform... Yeah, but I don't and think society the has agreed. That's the issue. It seems like these are some of the most contentious issues right now. Well, it's it kind of depends. There have been points in time, in even in our more recent history, where there's been sort of a, a an ebb and flow of what society thinks of these things. Like I remember, um, I remember back in '88, David Duke was running for president, mm -hmm. and it was considered to be generally very detestable and people were wondering how is it that this person is even getting to the point of having any kind of rev relevance why is he showing up in debates why is he being you know showing up on these various you know news outlets and such mm -hmm. and people were shocked by it and it caused a bit of a backlash a social backlash and what happened was he did eventually get black holed 
by the general media and general, you know, back then, you know, newspapers, et cetera, took stances and said, we're not going to write about this guy. We're not going to platform him effectively. Right. They didn't call it platforming back then. Yeah. But um, it, there was a reaction to the fact that this former grand wizard of the KKK is somebody who had been seen on college campuses wearing an, an actual Nazi uniform. Mm -hmm. They were like, can't believe this dude has gotten any kind of media time at all. And people reacted and he got black hold. So society kind of collectively agreed detestable views. We don't want to see that. We don't want that making it to, you know, our channels, our TV stations and our newspapers. So generally society agreed we're done with it. And that was back when a lot of these papers and such had a good mix of conservative and liberal representation, right? It wasn't as polarized in terms of the media at the time. There was a bit more of a mix. You didn't really have like predominantly conservative news outlet and predominantly liberal outlet. They were a little bit more murky and a little bit more blended back then. Okay. I don't know what you want to say about that. So like, I, it makes me wonder sometimes if, if you get to the point, you platform somebody, you get their ideas out there. And if collectively people agree they're detestable, we're not going to platform anymore. Doesn't it stand to reason that maybe that's the direction that things are moving if these platforms don't want to platform them? So here's, this is what I think. Um, I think that there might be, there might be a society where I'm okay with deplatforming. But when so many of our institutions have become so ideologically intolerant and orthodoxy, and when it seems like people don't know how to defend their ideas anymore, that that's the time when, when deplatforming is paired with that, I'm not happy with it. So let's say that it was the case that when you went to college campuses, there was a diversity of speech, you got exposed to a lot of ideas. You know, if somebody comes up to you and they're like, you know what, I think that actually the alt-right is cool. Like you'd be like, oh, well actually I think they're bad for a whole host of reasons. And you can have that conversation. If that was like what our students were capable of um, and what we were capable of as a society, politically, culturally, whatever, I think I'd be more okay with it. But when we've excised those ideas from every part of society, and people don't know how to argue for the things that they believe in anymore. I think a lot of people don't know how to argue for tenets of liberalism. Um, or, or yeah, because a lot of progressives are, are not even liberal. They're, they're illiberal in some ways. Um, that that when, we, um, when we look at things like that, and then we have these same people in charge of like deplatforming people, we're not like, there's a difference between an educated society where people are like, yeah, you know, I think collectively we're intelligent enough to know that we don't need to host these ideas and we probably shouldn't have some of these out here versus society that's like, that idea is scary, mean, and racist, and it needs to go. And that latter society is, I think, prone to, that latter society is prone to so much bad shit. And I think we're seeing that, like, play out with Kefels right now, who's like an internet terrorist. But people are just like, oh, well, they're canceling things, but they're trans, so it's probably good. Yeah, if people are making decisions based on Wait, certain hold on. Sorry, one second, just because my chat is linking stuff. Um, I don't know if you guys missed all of the conversations I've had with anybody ever, um, but I agree with this 100%. That's the whole point of everything I've been talking about. I don't know why you would think I disagree with this. If Lycan is in chat, um, Lycan was actually with me. We just went out to eat with my parents like two hours ago. I was eating lunch with them, and I literally gave this example at the lunch table where I was talking to my parents, like, yeah, you know, we're, right now in my community, we're talking about calling people fascists or Nazis, and everybody's mad, and my mom and dad were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, but mom, the reason why we're doing it is because of people like you, and you guys used to call everybody communist when I grew up. And she's like, well, I think the whole Democratic Party are communists. Really, mom? What do you think a communist is? And she's like, well, somebody that's evil. <laughs> I'm like, okay, mom, thanks. <laughs> um, but my mom, my mom and dad are older, so they're honest about it. They're like, yeah, well, when I say someone's a communist, I mean that they're evil. They hate America. I'm like, well, based. At least you're honest about it. Thank you, mom. Thank you. You're based, mom. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to disagree with what Noah says. I agree one million percent. And I always give examples on both sides. For instance, when uh, people on the right call people groomers or pedophiles, that's become their way of just saying, oh, that person's LGBT. Like, you're destroying those words as well, 100%. Yeah, I agree. This is a problem that happens on both sides, not just the left. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, where were we? <laughs> I forgot where we were. Yeah, sorry, I kind of fucked you there. Uh, it's all right. I don't know. Maybe one of my someone in my chat can say, or maybe in your chat. Um, no, I, I like. Well, if we want to go back to that a little bit, that's one of the issues that I have with. Like, I'm constantly pushing back on the term transphobe because it's just so watered down right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, like, that's a really big. Oh, oh! I should have brought that up with Mr. Girl. Would you say that Mr. Girl's transphobic? 
I say that he holds some transphobic positions, but I don't think he's a transphobe. Okay. That's interesting because he literally doesn't believe that trans people exist. <laughs> so it seems like in most it, definitions of the word, it feels like people would probably call him transphobic. Um, but probably yeah. would, because it, but it, having multiple con having had multiple conversations with him about it, there's mm -hmm. some there are some underlying factors that I don't I would say that there's nuance there to be explored. Yeah, I and agree I with kinda, that. That's why I don't call him transphobic. But like, yeah. if I'm called transphobic for being a transmedicalist, like a light transmedicalist, barely for true scum, true scum people are called transphobic. Then Mister would absolutely be called transphobic to like the vast majority of people. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But then that's kind of like like what is far right, what is you know left. Sure, which is all part of my point. Yeah. Needles. Let's just attack the positions instead of getting obsessed with labels. But yeah. But okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm like well well here's actually a good reason why i think there's some utility in label i think most people could probably say now you you can push back if i if you think i'm wrong people if you're listening but i think most people would say that if i said somebody is a transphobe they'd probably be like okay there's some validity to that because zonia rarely calls people transphobe right maybe so, in your community that's true that was part of the um the big is syllogism only premise premise conclusion i don't remember if you can call a syllogism or not but like with that when i built up those four premises yesterday that was one of the things i said i can control it in my community but i'm talking to people outside of my community if i start throwing these words like nobody knows who like if you use transphobe outside of your community people don't know how you use that word if i'm talking to sneakers audience and i use like toxic masculinity they don't know how i'm using that word right so i kind of lose control once i'm in other audiences i think yeah that's true i forgot that you had even expanded on that particular yeah. scenario um yeah, so um, what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about the uh, the platforming discussion. Mm -hmm. Where did we leave off with that? <laughs> um, you were bringing up that track. Max kind of had like a paradox related to platforming. Yeah, we kind of dug into that a bit. And, oh, that's right. That's what I was going to say. So you were talking about like at colleges, like the the young people at colleges, that they're mm -hmm. not even capable of having this, these discussions and that they just want to avoid it because from their perspective, it's effectively ontologically evil. Mm -hmm. And so they don't end up building the tools necessary to push back against harmful ideologies that are, you know, that can be snuck in at that point. I think that's where you're going with it, right? If you write off this sort of general spectrum of ideology as just ontologically evil, you're not prepared for those who can sneak in positions from that ideology by just by arguing them on their own merits or by certain yeah. lines of logic and i feel like because or god yeah, because you've effectively blinded yourself to yeah them. exactly yeah and i feel like i hate to do this to mr girl because it's like because you could argue that oh well i'm just a good debater so i can do this right but like it feels like every time we've had like a sample debate i feel like i can crush it with the alt-right or Nazi talking points. Like I can represent those arguments really well. And I feel like he has no response to them whatsoever. And it's like, if you're the person saying that we ought to call a Nazi a Nazi, but when I give you the actual Nazi talking points, you have nothing to say about it. Like, well, I feel like that's not good. Like it's showing it, it, to some extent, like the weakness of your side that like, okay, well, you wanna call a Nazi a Nazi, that's fine. How do you argue against like Putnam's research and social cohesion and the fact that every single country you want to like make America look like is like 95% white. And most progressives are dead in the water. But, and we haven't even, we haven't even begun arguing that. But those two premises right there, it's like, oh, well, it's, uh, it's different. It's not, well, it's, uh, like they're done. They're already done. And it's like, okay, well, like at what, now what was the point of your label there? Like you, you got all the moral condemnation about it. You feel good about it. But now that you've used it, the label itself has almost robbed you of the ability to have an understanding of what's going on because you're relying on the moral condemnation of the label and not the underlying understanding and moral condemnation of the ideology. Like what is it beneath the label that, that you're looking for to get upset about? Because that's what you should be focused on, in my opinion. Yeah, I would agree with that. But there's one area where I would kind of, where I start to ask questions. Yeah. And obviously, I think I think you and I would basically agree that it should that these are things that we should be prepared to argue against and should be prepared to to have conversations about so that we can have that argumentation so that we know how to argue against these things and know how to not just how to argue against them but even how to spot them if somebody's sneaking them in. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to have those conversations. But then there's the other question: is okay if the majority of the of youth or the younger generations mm -hmm. are primarily in agreement that we have signed off on this general scope of positions being well, as, as the meme goes ontologically evil and we don't want to even consider it 
that's also kind of society moving in a direction to say we're done with it we're not going to consider it anymore which is kind of like what germany did when you know and um after um after world war ii that's a big they one there laid that's down a big a, that's a big part of they that. laid down yeah they laid down a whole bunch of laws that basically say you're not even allowed to talk about this you yeah no no but i'm saying that it was after a, a yeah. war we'd kill a lot of people <laughs> to make that shit yeah. work liberalism didn't defeat uh nazism and the free marketplace of ideas it, they defeated it on the battlefield when it came to world war ii that was significantly different the problem is that right now those i clearly those ideas haven't been fully defeated in our society yet because there's a lot of people that are playing with them and considering them in a lot of different ways. And I think that um, this is a complaint I think I've made maybe for four years now or five years now. We lost the ability to argue for a lot of the things that we believe in liberalism. Like given the opportunity to argue about things like racism or slavery or women's rights, we actually, it feels like we just don't know how to do it anymore. And that's really problematic, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, well, and I think part of it goes towards this labeling thing, the obsessive labeling thing. I've definitely noticed this is a critique I've recently come to to recognize is that I don't not even so much the labeling becomes more just this easy means to deal with fatigue around talking about issues. No, hold I've on. Noticed... I, I'm not letting people slip these. In. It's not right, fatiguing. Okay. It's not fatiguing. It's not hard to just say what a person believes. That's easy. Like, why do you hate Nick yeah. Fuentes or why do you hate this person? Oh, he believes in fucking race realism. The guy thinks that black people are genetically retarded. Oh, cool. I can say that. That's super easy. It's super short. The idea that it's so hard to say. You're acting like I'm saying you have to write a paper every time you want to condemn somebody's point of view. That's not, you don't have to do that. It's not, it's not hard. <laughs> the labels don't make it any easier. And they're I detrimental. Mean, this, Sorry. Okay, go on. I, I agree with you, but I have noticed a trend and there seems to be a bit of fatigue, at least. I think it's sort of a, it's, I think that there are a couple of things playing into it. There's sort of something to really consider for a lot of people in our space who are streamers and do this kind of stuff, debating these kinds of things. It becomes where when people sort of build a brand on top of that, and that is their cash cow, that's how they're making their money, etc. So they get into sort of this system of doing these debates, doing these panels, building an audience, etc. They get to a point where they get tired of running over the same old conversations over and over again. And so it they do be, I call it fatigue because that's the way it plays out. It's sort of a um, a fatigue on these issues and they end up taking shorthand. A lot of times you have conversations now with certain streamers who've been doing this for a while. You okay, you wait, hold on real quick. I'm pushing, I'm pushing here. Nobody's okay. been doing this as long as me. Okay, so I've been here a while as well. It's not like, yeah, so I'm doing it You're for a long exception. time. Well, no, I'm not an exception. I am the, I'm the, the, template <laughs> the, you, uh, literally well, like for people like Vajra Hassan, i am the template that was coming so don't I, so i understand what you're saying some people have been debating for a long time against these like, yeah i know that's me i know but when you're saying things like it's fatiguing or whatever if i'm gonna be in a debate i'm trying to think of an example of when would i need to have a label to reduce my fatigue what, what, like how is it ever a thing well this is sort of this is sort of where I see the pattern anyway, and I'm not even sure how to address it, but it comes down to where people get into two things playing on it. One, they've had the conversation a million times before, well, exaggerating, but still many times before. And then two, they're making pretty good money. And so they combine those two pressures combined. And then what they do is they kind of settle into a rhythm of just kind of sustaining. And when it comes to those topics that they've had, that they've talked about so many times all over and over again, they are more bad faith with their approach to the topic and instead will lean on these labels and quickly dismiss somebody as, oh, well, you're just a Nazi, et cetera. Well, then just, it seems to be then it sounds like they just shouldn't have those conversations. If you don't want to talk to Nazis or talk about this, then just don't. Just don't have the conversation. Yeah. You don't have to I talk to everybody. And if you're going to talk to one of those people and your goal is to just write them off as a Nazi or whatever, it sounds like you probably shouldn't have the conversation with them because you're either, you're fatigued on it, which by the way is fine. There are like, like I'm not talking to Ryan Dawson for a reason. There are certain people that I don't want to talk to. It'll happen. Um, I don't think that's a condemnation of the person. But like, if you don't feel like, oh, like calling out a Nazi and going through their beliefs is so frustrating. Well, why the fuck are you debating them? They just don't have, a, don't debate them. It's not easy. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think we, you and I generally agree on this. I won't really push into it too much. I was just kind of wandering with my thoughts there when I thought about that. But, um, okay. So there was one other thing. Well, there's a couple other things I want to touch on, but I'll start with this one for now, just because it was, this is kind of where you, so Max brought up an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. So he brought up when he was talking about 
So this is something I think should just be expected. Like you're going to get a lot of criticism on who you platform, especially when somebody for them, the stakes are very high. So in case of Nick Fuentes and Max, Max is Jewish. Nick Fuentes has definitely advocated for anti-Semitic policies and positions. Mm -hmm. So there's the stakes are very high for him. Mm -hmm. And like with me, I'm trans. Also, half of my family is Jewish. So I have that problem as well. You know, I have stakes mm -hmm. are much higher for me. Gotcha. So it when you're in a space that a lot of people share, where there's a lot of dialogue being brought up and people end up like as Max brought up, they have connections with each other. There's networking opportunities. One thing leads to another. Next thing you know, somebody's being platformed on another channel because they were platformed on yours, etc. I'm not going to push on the Sneeko thing. I was I agreed with you on that, but there are networking opportunities as well as the opportunity for someone to be seen like for someone who isn't as keyed into someone like Nick Fuentes to think of him as like, oh, I thought he was kind of a bad guy, but seems pretty easy going, seems pretty friendly overall, you know, cut this one stream where Destiny, I know he's pretty popular, had a lunch with the guy and everything seemed pretty jovial, right? Mm -hmm. But it makes perfect sense for a lot of people, especially for them where the stakes are higher to go and be like, hold on one second, you're opening up a, a number of doors for this person, both to help uh, rehabilitate their reputation or play down the threat of, that they pose, as well as to give them more connections and broader access to a space, especially when you've got a platform as big as yours and a reputation like yours. And sure, but then that's, I don't like that argument because that puts me in Vosh world where I can't, then I can't engage with anybody who isn't bigger than me. And there's like, as, especially as I'm growing in size, like there's a decent number of smaller creators that I think have interesting things to say. I think Fuentes has interesting things to say that are worth pushing back on. But if I draw those rules out for myself, now I'm like locked out from being able to engage with anybody that is a smaller platform than me, which I don't like. I don't think it's good. Gorbachev, wait, what? Sorry. So when it comes to the more cash kind of interactions, oh, for instance, doing lunch with him, um, is that in that kind of situation. So this is the way I kind of looked at it when you did that, because I was kind of shocked when you had that lunch with him, but I looked at it at the time and kind of stopped, took a step back and I looked at it as this is sort of, you know, building on rapport or maintaining, you know, sort of a relationship, right? But there is an opportunity there for that exposure in that situation where you're, you're having a casual, lighthearted conversation with them. Somebody drops into your stream because it's in the algorithm. You know, they see him, they're like, oh, I guess he's not such a bad guy after all. There, there's a big window there for a lot of people to have someone like Fuentes or anybody like that have the reputation be really rehabilitated by dropping in at that point in time. Sure, and my goal when I engage the with them is to be accurate and honest and provide the necessary pushback when I engage with them. That's, I mean, that's all I can do. And that's, that's what I will do. And I will continue to do that. And I think I've done a pretty good yeah. job of that so far. Um, and I think I'll continue to do a good job at that. Um, I don't buy into the like hyper social contagion idea that like if he touches an audience, it's like, boom, they got turned into Nazis. And now they're like, it's like the fucking White Walkers or whatever, raising the dead. Um, <laughs> like, I understand there's some fear there and there's some worry and you're playing with fire a bit and it's a little bit like it could be dangerous. Sure. But I mean, like, that's part of what we're doing for online politics. And I think we're I've already done a horrible job thus far, so I'm trying a different approach. Approach. I'll see what happens, I guess. Yeah, I've definitely noticed your approach has changed a lot in recent, you know, last year, really. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's something I definitely, like, I notice it. I try to think about it. So, well, here's a question for you. How much of what... Um, there's obviously, there's a... There's a relationship that has to be maintained. If you want to continue having access to a person, you have to kind of build on a relationship or build rapport with that person, right? So that requires you to have some kind of cordial behavior with them, even if you significantly disagree with their positions or find them to, to be de detestable. So do you find yourself having to curtail your actual, or like hold back your disgust at some things that he says in order to maintain a relationship with him? No, I don't think so. If he says something I find disgusting, then I call it out. I've never had problems with that before in the past. That's why people call me a bridge burner. If I disagree with somebody on something, I'll say something about it. Hmm. I'm thinking back on the conversation over lunch 
and I'm thinking back at certain points where it was like, and even though I know it's been misconstrued, like the part where he asked that that guy, hey, are you Jewish? I know that was misrepresented. But just the fact that he even asked that question to me is like red flags. Like, why the heck are you even asking if he's Jewish? He's, like, that's it's an edgy I'm joke. Doing. But like, I'm pretty sure I literally even say afterwards, like, bro, do you just ask everybody if they're Jewish? What were you going to do if he was Jewish? Like, I'm pretty sure I roasted him for that a little bit. Yeah, it's just one of those things where I'd be like, dude, come on, right? As soon as somebody says it, right? I wouldn't even allow that window of opportunity to, you know, to go by. I'd be like, come on, why the hell are you even asking him that? Like, right in the middle, just kind of interrupt it. You know, or be like, bro, chill. We're, we're just having lunch. Don't be asking people what their ethnicity is. I think that I right? think I pushed back on it. And like, it, he was clearly joking. And I think I gave him like a little bit of a pushback on it. But like, I'm not going to be like, put down the fork, Nick. We need to talk about I, I, I don't think it was. <laughs> that would like, have been funny, actually. <laughs> but I'm, I'm pretty sure I literally said afterwards, like, what were you going to do if he was Jewish? Are you going to actually go and fight him? I'm pretty sure I cringed when he said it. Like, it's, it's like a really, um, it's honestly, it's a really good opportunity to kind of slip in. Even but I literally jokingly. did. I did do this. Well, like you could slip in even jokingly, like, dude, and you wonder why people call you a Nazi? You are playing right into what everybody believes. They you know that, that, though. Right? They know this. Gripers love it when they're called Nazis. They also love it when you make fun of Nick yeah. for being gay and into cat boys. Like, this is the type of shit that they get off on. It's funny as fuck to them. Like, to put, spin it around, okay? Here's the thing that people don't understand. If I go into their communities or other people go into their communities, they call him a Nazi. They find that shit funny the exact same way. Imagine when people come into my communities like, Destiny? Isn't that guy a fucking pedophile fascist? Like, when people say that, on the outside, they think the same that my community does when you call them a Nazi. Like, wow, he must be getting real mad we're calling him a Nazi. No, we just laugh at that shit because we know it's not fucking true. And because we know that they're getting super fucking irritated and heated over it, and it's not mapping on to any of this shit going on. Like, when somebody comes into my community, it's like, Destiny's a fucking Nazi. Everybody's laughing about it. Nick's community is probably the exact same way. Like, I think that the way that you have to, like, disentangle and then attack these issues, it has to be done in a very, very, very sophisticated manner that's not just, like, being constantly critical and the Nazi word and blah, 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 blah. Like, I, I don't know. I, listen, if you guys can point me out to other people doing it, or you can give me other templates, then I, I'll, I'll, I'm curious and I'll, and I'll look at it. But the problem is that like I'm trailblazing on all of this, and I have for five years. Nobody is doing any of the things that I've been doing for like the past like five or six years. And every step I take in a certain direction is the first step that anybody's taken in that direction. So I understand some criticism. I'm fine with that. You, you can like say like, oh, I think you could do this or that or that or that. But like at some point, I'm gonna have to say, okay, well. I've moved a lot in this direction, and I think I've made a fuck ton of progress. I can see it in my comments, his comments, my um, emails, and my communities. For people to continue to be ultra critical, at some point, I gotta say, all right, where's the counterexample? Can you show me somebody else that is being as or more effective than me that, that is engaging in this stuff? I'd love to see it, because if there was, I'd just fucking copy it. If you show me something where it's like, oh, somebody did that or that, because actually, <laughs> if anything, that's where I'm at, that's how I'm at where I'm at right now, is sometimes I'll see examples of things like, fuck, I really like the way that guy handled that thing. Or I love the way that he addressed that point or he tied in that thing to that thing, and I'll copy those things when I see him. But I don't see that anywhere. I'm sure as fuck I'm not copying anything off of Vosh. He's fucking horrible. Hassan is just like a clout shark, you know, progressive bot. Um, I don't know anybody. Sean and Jen are like hand ring over everything. Like, I, who else am I? Who is who's the who else am I supposed to copy? Like, can you point? I'm sorry. I'm like screaming at you. I don't mean to scream at you. Yeah, like, but yeah, like, well, yeah. Where yeah. where where are the examples of anybody else dealing with shit in a way that it's like, oh, I should like copy that a little bit? I have a feeling that you're just going to get a lot of pushback no matter what because of the fact that a lot of, for a lot of other people they're going to have higher stakes with regard to this than for yourself in many cases. And so uh, it's understandable that people are going to see red flags or, you know, they're going to be a bit alarmed because of the higher stakes for themselves. And they're going to worry also. I would, I'm would. i not going to speak for people, but I could imagine that a lot of people would worry that maybe you don't understand the kind of stakes that they have to worry about. No, I don't buy that. Kind of I don't buy that. Um, I, could, I could imagine people... No, even Max that, admitted, like, like, the chances of... Um, the chances of anything happening are very, very, very low. Even Max admitted that, like almost nothing. Oh, I agree. But I think a lot of people will have that that sense of alarm that, you know, Steven's being a little fast and loose with this because he doesn't have the same risk that the rest of us do, right? That I could totally see people having that position and being alarmed by that. It's, I would say that it is an understandable concern from a lot of people. So you're probably going to get pushback on that. But, you know, 
Okay, well, listen, um, if the stakes are so high I, and they want to do it, then, fi then find me the other people that are doing it. If Mr. Girl wants to have a <laughs> interview with Fuentes, he said he's wanted to few times. I'd like to watch it. It'd be interesting. I'd like to see that, too, yeah. That'd be an interesting one. Um, well, there's one other thing that I figured I'd touch on that was yeah. really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And this is also brought up by Max. I think it was yesterday's conversation. Okay, okay gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Sorry, wait, hold on. I'm so sorry. This is so rude. I won't, This is the last time it's coming down. I'm never going to do this again because it's really, really annoying. Um, on you, it should be annoying for you. I'm sorry. I'm being really rude. Um, real quick. Every Nazi would lie about them not being a Nazi because it's taboo. If you have done things like Holocaust denial and believe in JQ, I think it's pretty obvious you're a Nazi. So does anybody remember Charlottesville? Those people weren't very uh, embarrassed. <laughs> Those people were like, like, yeah, anti-Semitism is unbelievably common throughout all of history. Arguably, Rashid Tlaib or whatever, or that one, um, the other one of the fucking four, maybe with the Israeli gays or whatever. Like, chill. Shut the fuck up, okay? Sorry, go. <laughs> um, okay, so Max brought up something oh, about, yeah, you, a bit about you lacking a like moral consistency or a, a strong moral position mm -hmm. and the way that you responded to it hang on let me read my notes real quick because i wrote this down i had to cram through your the yesterday's vod nice. um okay so you talked about like bending on things in order to have a conversation and such. I didn't say um, bending ever. I would never use that word because it's not describing anything that's happening, but. Or if I did, I that was a horrendous misspeak. That would be a oh, dramatically horrible misspeak if I said bending. This is what I see in a lot of people. I'm not saying this is specifically you, but I've observed, like I've, at times I can think back and I think it, it wouldn't surprise me if you were doing this at this point where it's like, sometimes what people will do is they they will have a moral position on something but they will do something that violates their their own moral code and you said you 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 did that you said you did a moral wrong you know when you said certain things um and that you recognize that and that you shouldn't have said those things but i think oftentimes what a lot of people will do is they will kind of post hoc justify in order to hold something that they want to like hold to some position that they want to hold to or continue doing something that, that they want to continue doing and they don't always keep themselves in check they'll try to post hoc justify oh no i i it's okay that i did this because i did it for this reason um and where am i even going with this <laughs> i took horrible notes on this because i crammed this one in the morning mm -hmm. when i was going through this vod um do you are you analyzing why it is that you do things consistently? Like, do you... I mean, obviously, I'm going to say yes to that. I hope I am. I would hope so, too. I like to think that I do, but even I will do irrational things and sometimes even try to post-talk, justify them. Hopefully, I catch myself when I do it and be like, no, this is me just trying to rationalize what I'm doing. But... Man, I should have taken better notes on this one. I wish I could remember the context that this came up in. I remember what the context was exactly. The conversation was, was why I'm not making moral arguments in the face of people that have different moral systems than me. And my response was that when I'm arguing with them, I usually like to step inside their moral framework and argue from within that to show them why the things they're advocating for are inconsistent. And I hope to point them into a conclusion in their moral framework that also coincides with the conclusion in my moral framework. And Mr. Grove was upset because he says, well, sometimes you just need to call people evil or bad because it's their evil in your moral framework. Well, right before you pulled me on, you said that Vosh was evil. Um, sure, I shouldn't have said evil. <laughs> I was joking when I said Vosh and Asana are evil. They're probably not actually evil people. I was laughing with my audience about it. I'm like surprised that Destiny used that word. And, but Because uh, it doesn't really fit what you generally talk about. Like, I can't imagine you writing people off as evil. Sure. But, Do you, sure. I'm not legitimately writing off Washer Son as evil. I'm like memeing like, oh, yeah. Also, when I call Kevils a terrorist, I don't think she probably fits the legal FBI definition of like a terrorist or whatever. Uh, OK. All right. Well, that's that fits more in line with what I was hoping, which is that you are going to question and consider things um, instead of just kind of 
because if he did lean on moralistic labels, I would think, okay, well then, yeah, Max has a really good point. Maybe why aren't you using moralistic labels in these cases or having moralistic positions that you would fall back on in these cases? Like, I would argue that I know you want to have sort of a logical approach to decision making, right? And you want to be able to argue these things. But I would also argue that society, our collective societal wisdom, isn't always logical. We have a lot of policies in place. We have a lot of things that aren't built upon just, you know, logical deduction or, you know, coming to these conclusions after trials, you know, and tests and such. We have a lot of things built into our collective conscience and into our systems, even our legal systems, that are not always rational. And sometimes we figure that out later on, you know, these things will get tested in the courts of law and such, or, you know, in various other scenarios, and we'll say, yeah, this doesn't hold up to, you know, our current beliefs or your current societal understanding of things, or this penalizes a bunch of people that it shouldn't penalize, etc. But they're not always rational. I think it's okay to sometimes have positions that are based upon, uh, you know, less logical I think it's okay for humans to have sort of a, a yeah. Okay, wait, hold on. Let's summarize all this. Yeah, I understand right? what you're saying. So every so every single law, every single morality, uh, every single like ethical f decision that we have isn't something that we arrive at through like deductive logics, like hardcore examination. Yeah. Right. Sure. Of course. That doesn't change anything though. When it comes to convincing another person, though, that's not a satisfying answer. That's not going to help me at all. Right. The point is to always convince them. Yeah. I think within their framework, because it's easier to convince somebody within their own framework than to change their whole framework. Do you think that there is... Or hold on. If you want to have this conversation, okay. let's work within the realm of real examples. Sure. Because I'm way more... Uh, okay that works that, for me. Yeah. What, so give me an example, and I can give you, I tell you different ways that I would approach it. Okay. So part of the reason why Nick Fuentes is written off by a lot of people is because he holds two positions that we could all argue are not rational. And... He's not interested from everything that we've been able to tell. He's not really interested on moving on these. He's talked a lot about obfuscating. He talks to, we have lots of clips of him talking to his audience about obfuscating your true beliefs and your true intentions. Okay, okay let me, let me summarize more. Slide, slide wait, wait, real quick. Let so, me summarize. Wait, let me summarize what he means when he says that. Because when people say that, oh, he talks about obfuscating, people sound like if you go and you turn on his stream, he might be saying some things like, Hello, guys. Today, the monitor white TV, ceilings, and Jewish people. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, it's total obfuscation. That's not what he means when he says that. What he means when he says that, if you watch that clip and you watch like the five minute discussion around it, what he's saying is that sometimes humor lets you push boundaries or joke about things in a farther way than you couldn't actually state the position. So maybe Fuentes says something, maybe here's like, let's say this is the front facing belief. Fuentes might think the elites are in control of society, but his true belief is those elites are overwhelmingly Jewish, okay? But the joke is gonna go even farther than that. So what Fuentes might say, he might come out and he might make a joke on stage about, um, uh, he might make a joke on, on stage. Um, uh, what's the name of the Friday Jewish holiday? <laughs> Fuck, Dan always talks about this, Shabbat, right? Fuentes might come out on stage and he might say something like, uh, like hey guys, what's up? I'm glad I could talk to you guys here today. Um, I'm glad you all made it. I'm surprised that the uh, media didn't cancel me. Uh, and then somebody might laugh. You're like, huh, just kidding. It wouldn't be the media. <sighs> um, we know who would cancel me, but there's a reason why I held this on Friday night, so they'd all be busy. He might make a joke like that. And now the joke is like, oh my God, Fuentes thinks Jewish people are going to cancel him. And that's like how people respond to the joke. But that's not really what's happening. He's joking about something that is extremely ironic and funny, but it's over so far away that it probably misses the actual position, which is still kind of anti-Semitic that he thinks Jews have like a disproportionate place in the media. So in a way, he's able to use humor like that to flirt with the more radical idea while still having like a front-facing thing that's okay and acceptable. But the problem is that the reason why that obfuscation works so well is that people will look at the joke and they'll go, Nick Fuentes thinks Jews are controlling everything. Holy fuck. And then normal people will run and they will attack the joke. Like the joke is 100% honest about what's going on. And then you look crazy because one, even Fuentes' true position is probably not that radical. And the stated positions are absolutely not that radical. And then that humor allows you to do two things. One, it lets you kind of put that idea in people's minds. They're like, oh, you 
know, the Jews, you know, once, I mean, hey, you know, they're, look at the CEOs, you know, you're kind of joking about it. So it gets the idea in people's minds. And two, it's hard to attack because people on the left will run full force into the wall and attack the joke when that's not actually what's going on. And then they keep citing this clip of me over and over again saying, Fuentes uses humor to flirt with the truth. And then people like Rose Wrist and Stockton Love are like, look, every joke that he makes, when, when, when Fuentes says that, what Fuentes is admitting is every single joke is 100% the truth. No, that's not how that works, okay? Oof. Sorry, yeah, well, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a sophisticated it's, use of language and it requires a sophisticated yeah. mode of analysis. But the way that people engage with that quote is they basically throw it at me and they go, look, Destiny, look at this quote from Fuentes. He believes every single thing that he jokes about. It's like, no, that's not what that means. But it's hard to, yeah, sorry, okay. <laughs> it, it's it's <laughs> okay, a complicated so, use of language and irony, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, um, no, I, I get what you mean there. And I know it's also intended to kind of trigger, you know, the um, those who would call him out, right? It's uh -huh. like it gets people to jump at shadows constantly and they look ridiculous uh however something really interesting happened i've got a quote dgg hate raid um going on people all saying all kinds of transphobic things and spam and n-words and stuff which is fun uh do people it's funny that people actually believe that this stuff is dgg because they go and they say it dgg raid dgg raid and they spam the n-word and stuff yeah um uh my mods are starting to act on it now nice but, yeah I, uh, if it makes you feel better, the um, the person that is uh, hate rating you, because um, I look at the cozy TV streams and I had this guy's chat up for a while. It's the Jimbo Zoomer dude. Uh, like you can, they're laughing right now in chat because they, yeah, okay. they're all Hello, saying a spam. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, good one, How Jimbo. Good one. good one. Good <laughs> one. Okay. I don't know why people believe this stuff, man. I've had people blame me for hate raids all the time. It's like you know, if it's got my name in it, it's probably not me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's obviously they're <clears throat> intending you to think that it's me. Yeah. But um. Yeah. So, uh, so c going back to like the moralistic position, it could be easily argued that Nick Fuentes has this very staunchly held moralistic position that he doesn't want to move on, that his audience does as well, that they're going and like, if anybody wants to share it, I'm sure there's a, a clip that somebody's got, if somebody wants to share it in chat, but of Nick Fuentes, where he says the whole, the, the clip where he talks about how, why we say talking about baking cookies uh -huh. instead of saying the other thing like he's obviously describing how it is to do the jqing in a way that slips in under the radar right yeah so but again this is something that's part and parcel with his brand a little bit but like easily... again this is how i like this and this is like <sighs> this is why i like doing what i do and i wish people if, if anybody else wants to jump in and do this this is fine okay but this is what's going to happen when those types of jokes are made okay if i had to guess what an America first person thinks about the Holocaust, this is gonna be my guess, okay? An America first person, if you ask them, do you think the Holocaust actually happened? The, the, if I had to guess, and I am guessing, I could be totally wrong, but if I had to guess, what they would probably say is, okay, yeah, the Holocaust happened, but six million is a huge number, and it's fucking war, lots of people are killing people, the Soviets did it. The United States interned fucking Asian people. Um, a lot of people were killed and uh, probably not as many as they say, maybe 600,000, maybe 100,000. And there are other horrible atrocities like the Dresden bombings that we never seem to talk about. And I just think it's really weird that we're still obsessing over the Holocaust 80 years later. That's, I imagine that if you, if you cornered most American first people, that's gonna be like probably the answer they give. But when people go to attack Fuentes or America first, what they'll say is, you guys don't believe in the Holocaust at all. And most of them probably aren't at that position. It's like, no, oh, it probably happened to some extent. It's just like super overly exaggerated and obsessed over. But when you come at it from the position of like, oh, well, look at Nick making those jokes. It's because they don't believe in the Holocaust at all. Now you look crazy. And now you've lost the ability to even have a conversation with anybody. You've totally lost the ability to engage. No, I agree. If you're going to address people based on those positions that they hold, yeah, you should be much more nuanced in that and engage with it in good faith and try to really dig into it. But could you, can you understand why someone like Max, for instance, would say that it's okay to say, to have a moralistic position and say, these people just believe detestable things and they're entrenched in it. Yeah, he can do that. Why would you even bother? I, he can do that, but I don't care. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to appease everybody's emotional reaction to something, especially if it inhibits my rhetorical effectiveness. If he wants to have an emotional reaction to it, that's totally fine. It's based. He can do that. And he can even show that to me to some extent, but I'm not going to change up how I function to appease somebody else's emotional reaction to things, especially if I think it's like less effective in communicating with people. Yeah, it's... One of the problems that I run into, so I don't, 
so I don't deal with these people on platforms. So I, my position is like, I, I'm not going to platform them mainly because I don't have to be constantly keyed into exactly every little thing they're trying to slip in under the radar to be ready to counter it all. So I don't usually deal with these people on, uh, you know, on a platform where I think I'm, I may slip up and allow them to slide that kind of shit through. But there is, there is sort of a, now I know you're pretty good at addressing it, but do you find yourself sometimes not catching things and letting those yeah things it's, it's possible i miss dog whistles sometimes there's jokes that i don't i don't understand enough but like ironically having other nazi friends has <laughs> has helped me understand some jokes uh but yeah i mean i'm sure i miss things sometimes I, i'm not perfect yeah what are okay so the problem that i see with those kinds of slip ups, and this is why I don't platform them myself, is that it allows certain types of conversation or not conversation, certain types of tropes to become popularized or to become slipped through into my audience. No, um, I, re I reject this. I, I, this is something where I'd have to push for okay. examples that like so many dog whistles slip through and my audience doesn't even know their dog whistles. And then we all start saying the dog whistles and then suddenly we all turn into Nazis. Like some dude makes a no. joke about like, how can you stay locked in that room when it's so hot in there? Like, isn't the door made of wood? And pretty soon everybody in my community is like, man, Destiny, you complain about, uh, you know, not being able to go outside, but all your doors are made of wood. And then one day somebody's like talking to my audience and just like they've drank the wine in a fucking attack on Titan. And somebody is like, Oh, did you know that the Jewish showers are made of wood so those people couldn't have possibly been incinerated? And then my whole community is like, oh, fuck, we're all Nazis. They get like transformed. I no, don't I don't, I don't, I don't think I don't there's think any, that, that anything like that. Could I think that those things just get signal boosted more and carried further yeah, but because the, of the fact if that the dog whistle is by people. If the dog whistle is, is so subtle that my community, nobody's even catching it, I don't think that that's having an effect. Like at that point, it's actually a literal dog whistle. Somebody's walking around blowing a whistle and no one can even hear what's, being ha what's happening. I, I don't think that's like, no, I don't think so. Well, the whole point of dog whistling, right, is it reaches, it has a message that goes out to a specific ear, people who are tuned into that. Yeah, but but, I, but dog whistling isn't done to turn people. Dog whistling is just done to be like, but, eh, kind of like the, you know, uh, give a little wink to your side. That's it. Dog whistle also, isn't. What else has the benefit of muddying the waters for everybody else? When no, you, when no, you have... I don't believe so. You don't think so? Dog whistling only okay, muddies so the say... waters if you engage with it in a, in a dumb way. The thing that hurts we know this, okay? The thing that damages people or, or can turn thoughts is problematic humor. We can talk about that. Dog whistles are, by definition, unhearable. <laughs> like, you can't hear, if, if the left just would stop engaging with dog whistles, then they don't work anymore, right? Imagine if, and I've said this a million times, imagine with the 4chan campaign, it's okay to be white. Imagine if some conservative strolls in with a shirt and he's on a college campus and everybody sees him with his it's okay to be white shirt. And Nobody really cares. Nobody's looking. And he walks up and says, like, hey, what's up? Like, oh, you say Black Lives Matter? I think it's okay to be white. And somebody looks at him and they're like, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's fine to be white, dude. It's like cringe as fuck. The dude's like, okay, well, <laughs> I just want you to, like, it's cringe. A dog whistle that people don't respond to is it, it's actually cringe as fuck. And then you look like a fucking loser. But instead, people say that it's okay to be white shirt and they start fighting with the dog whistle. By definition, it's called a dog whistle because it's not accurately resembling what's being said. And when you attack the dog whistle, now you look fucking unhinged. And now you've got a whole campaign saying, it's okay to be white. That's a white supremacist slogan. Wait, how the fuck is it saying it's okay to be white? A white supremacist slogan? Well, we can say it's okay to be black. It's okay to be Asian. How does that even make sense? And now you're in, in, in a world where you're not even boxing with shadows. You're boxing with brick walls and you look crazy. That's why I don't, if, I, if somebody wants to dog whistle, like if I hear it or whatever, I'll call that out, I'll make it stubborn, but I'm not going to sit there and like obsess over them. Problematic humor I'll focus on, but dog whistles? Fuck it, dude. Like, who cares? Nobody even knows what you're saying. You, and, then, and then we go through another internet phase where people are hunting down fucking people in Congress making the okay sign. I'm like, oh, we found him. Secret fucking Nazi. And I was like, really, dude? Well, that's the thing where I see it as sort of muddying the waters, where it becomes an easy way to veil a lot of other things, like veil intentions and such. If you can, if you can, uh, you know, if you can cause a dog whistle to spread really wide and far and cause a lot of alarmism around it, you can veil a lot underneath the, you know, the outrage of it or the alarm. No. Wrong. What the dog because whistle is, the dog whistle is actually the bait and the veil comes from the left or from the person engaging with the dog whistle. That's the issue. If somebody so walks around, and overreacting. yeah, if somebody walks around with a shirt saying it's okay to be white and everybody's like, okay, cool. 
and then you're done. That's it. They're not. They don't get to shield anything. Now, if you say that, it's somebody's like, it's okay to be white. Like, okay, well, I think it's okay to be white too. That's cool. And they're like, okay, well, black people have different brains than white people. Oh, cool. Well, now we have something to talk about. Let's talk about that. The dog whistle is is, is destroyed, and now you can actually debate them in the real positions. But when you've got a guy who's like, we'll say, a hardcore race realist, um, believes that like uh, differences in IQ between groups of people can be explained by biology or genetics, or, or largely explained by it. If you've got that kind of guy, if he walks into a room believing that, and he's got a shirt on saying it's okay to be white, and now everybody wants to fight over that, now the veil has been placed. Now nobody truly knows that guy's beliefs. Now that guy can convert a lot of people because they see how crazy the other response is. Look at all these people saying they don't even think it's okay to be white. A guy in the middle or a, an unconverted guy might look at them and be like, yeah, those people are fucking insane. And then you start getting a little bit closer to that. And it's like, I think it is okay to be white, blah, blah, blah. And now they've got like so much more cover. And that was my issue with Max's conversation. He keeps saying you're obfuscating, you're participating. The obfuscation is already happening. I'm trying to cut through it. Like the dog whistling isn't the problem. It's the people that jump at the dog whistling. That's the people that give the cover. That's what fucks everything up. And people know this. 4chan knows this. When they're making these like types of fucking uh, memes that it's okay to be white shit, they're not doing it because they're like, this is such a high level fucking blah, blah. They're doing this like, I wonder how fucking retarded it would be if somebody actually attacked the statement, it's okay to be white. I wonder if, if people would actually be stupid enough to, to jump and fight over that. And they did. People did fight over that. It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? No, I agree. The overreaction is part of the, is a problem and it's played into. Uh, but it, my concern, well, not, not even so much my concern is more of an observation is that these things, when they carried out to a broader audience, it kind of becomes something where it's, yes. So the dog whistles are often used. The popular ones are used in a way to sort of get attention and to get people to overreact. But there's also sort of the normalization of a dog whistle to the point where it's like, because you could observe someone use a dog whistle doing like a 1350 meme or something. And you'd go and say, Hey, you know, do you actually believe this? Could I have a conversation with you about it? But if you got a whole bunch of other people who don't actually believe the 1350 meme who put it out there and you're like, you can't even, you want to approach them and be like, do you believe this? Want to have a conversation about it? And they're like, no, 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 I was just memeing, you know? Well, what so is it, it does kind of muddy the waters and like who what's, you want well, to talk to and, what, and if you want to dismantle their positions or have a conversation about it. If you, what is a dog whistle that if normalized becomes harmful? I wouldn't say harmful. Because I think it's okay, what, what's a do dog anymore, whistle that right? if it becomes normalized is bad? Like n name any dog whistle. Um, I couldn't think of anyone that would be bad, but it's a very subjective term. But in terms of muddying water, harmful muddying water, bad, certain, whatever you want to say, muddying what, waters is bad. Yeah. What? what? Well, if it, if it if it becomes to a point where it's widespread and you're kind of like, well, I do want to address people who believe in 1350 stuff. But I can't, you know, there's so many people using the meme, I can't really discern what it, but the problem is who I need to 13, talk to. But this is the issue. When you say 1350 is a meme, what do you mean by that? Well, like people who would who would play on that meme or would use it, you know, would put the meme out there, right? So. Um, but what do you mean by, what do you mean by will, the 1350 meme? What is the meme? I'm more saying if somebody turned it into a meme or something. Well, no, right? no, tell so, me, just talk about that. What is? What do you mean by 1350, okay. the 1350 meme? So if somebody were to kind of lean into uh, a joke about how 13% of the population were, you know, responsible for 50% of the crime and kind of meme on it, right? Well, no, no, no. People use Where is, what's, the, what's the meme? Um, a lot of people on the left don't know this. And I looked at the ADL website, even checked this, or it might have been the SPLC website. 1350 is a real stat. That's not just a meme. That's not oh, no, fabricated. It's a, it's a, it's a real stat and something that can be argued and has sure, underlying but, conditions that cause it. That yeah, but that's fine. Sport. But the problem is, and I think you've almost just demonstrated what you said. People want to say 1350, that's a dog whistle meme. No, it's not. That's a real stat. You need to contend with that. But by hand waving yeah. it off as a meme and saying like, oh, well, I think that's just like harmful uh, Nazi talk or a bad meme or whatever. No, it's not. It's a stat. And, and this is, now this is like, I think I even write about this. I have a section of my manifesto talking about dog whistles. This is the issue is that now we've assumed that true positions, true statistics are dog whistles. Now we've lost our ability to even engage with reality, I think, because now we're like, well, 1350, that's just a racist meme. That's a stat, dog. How can the fucking stats be racist? That sounds like some shit conservatives would say to make fun of people on the left. In my no, opinion. I agree with you there. But where I find an issue is like, I'll give an example. So this is something I've encountered a few times where people would like were interested or they, they carried on like the honkler meme. Right. And, you know, 13, uh, the, the 1350 meme for that was like 
thirteen percent of honks or something or other, right? And I've seen people carry that on and like share out honkler memes and stuff like that, not even realizing what it actually meant underneath it all. And I'm like, hey, you know, do you actually, you know, is this something you're actually like you're holding to? You want to talk about it and then i start breaking it down i realize they don't even realize what they're doing they're just basically reiterating something that they thought was kind of quirky and funny that like you know friend groups of theirs or people on 4chan were using or whatever right and so it I, becomes disseminated yeah through whatever medium they're i, I, I know, understand or whatever community they're i understand in. what you're that's what i mean by muddying the waters yeah i understand what you're because, saying here but i don't i don't think this stuff muddies the waters i think that the um I think that the engagement with this is way too fantastical. I think that if your meme is so good and so undercover that you're able to like spread it to other communities without them knowing, I think that when they find out what it actually is, they'll just go like, oh, oof, that's actually really weird. And then they'll just stop doing it. I don't think anybody got secretly turned by like friend world. I think there were a lot of normies that got caught up sharing friend world comics, but though that racism was so subtle, they had no fucking idea. And I like Emia was a person in my community that actually had a huge thing on this. But when people found out about it and they were like, oh shit, that's like Nazi shit, oof. They like backed away from it. Because like the, you, yeah, you can't, if a same. dog whistle is literally unhearable, you can't turn somebody with that. You're not gonna like actually change their underlying thoughts or beliefs. They're just gonna see it as like a funny cool. comic and that's it. And then like the people that are in charge of it are gonna have a little laugh because they're getting one over on normies that don't know they're spreading like Nazi shit. But like, it's not like you're actually converting people. But I'm, I'm not even so worried about that, but it's more like where the attention is drawn, right? So like I've talked to people, so I'm not even worried about them being converted. But for instance, you know, I've had the same experience as you where I break it down and I'm like, hey, by the way, do you know what that comes from? You know, I start talking to them about it and sure, they back off. They're like, oh, I didn't even realize the nature of it. I just thought it was funny and I have some friends who say it or something or I heard some heard it on some stream or something. Um, and so that's, that's where the muddying of the waters is. That's sort of like, it, it's kind of like, you normalize something, it becomes widespread. And it's like, okay, well, I actually want to address people who actually uh, believe that surface level statistic and are, you know, memeing on it. So I want to actually address those people and talk to them and break it down and be like, okay, do you know why that stat is what it is? So if I'm, if my attention is drawn in all these different directions and I try to talk to people and I find out like more than half of the people that I talk to just thought it was quirky and fun and reiterated it, then it's drawing my attention away from where it could be focused on actually addressing. I, I and again, I don't like. I'm, the, I'm just a stat without I, the under fundamental. Yeah, I'm, I, I just that comes from. I hand wave off all of these. I think that the statements are too general. When you say like focus is my attention, away, there's not significant attention being drawn here. Like you can. This is like a 20 second conversation. Like you know that friend world shit is like a Nazi meme, and they're like, wait, what do you mean? It's like, well, look at like these people are the Jews. These are like 1350 companies, and they're like, oh shit, yikes. Like that's it. It's not like oh god, my friend fell into friend world. I have to spend like the next like week doing like research. Blah, blah. Like I think that's a pretty quick and easy conversation. I I, I don't. I just. Sometimes when we say, I think sometimes we hand we like, well, we have to spend a lot of time doing this, or this is really problematic, or it's like, well, hold on, how much is, how difficult is this, or how problematic is this, or how much do you have to, I don't think there's much. I, I just, but hey, listen, again, man, if, if there are like counter examples or other templates for how people do this, then I'd be like, I'd love to see them, and I'd love to see it, and then I could like, yeah, I, 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 I could contend with it, but like, yeah, I just feel like I'm getting, <laughs> I feel well, like I my style of communication has been pretty, um, yeah, it has been like pretty accepted, but. Or, or yeah. successful, sorry. Um, I think a part of the problem with this whole thing is that, uh, you know, you can't, obviously we don't want to be, better way to word this. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to quantify the harm, right? We can be aware of the fact that there is some risk to these things, but quantifying the harm is very difficult to do. And obviously we don't want to be led by the boogeyman of harm which is where a lot of people will be like, well, that's why I have a moralistic position. I don't even want to deal with it. End of story. I've written it off, right? But again, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where if you do that, you leave yourself vulnerable to the arguments for, of those positions because you're not even, you're, you've blinded yourself to them. So people can sneak in those positions under the guise of something else. So yeah, I just, I just, I just don't agree. I think when people are sneaking in positions, that's going to come in the form of problematic humor. 
So like a way that I might sneak yeah. in certain racial or misogynistic or transphobic positions is going to be to make those types of jokes over and over and over and over again. And then slowly over time, I can probably turn somebody's mind. But it's not, it's just, it's not with dog whistles. That's just not how dog whistles work. Dog whistles are a way for me That's to true. say some shit and someone else kind of like wink at me like, ah, hell yeah, brother. And you're like, hell yeah, brother. HH, brother. And you're like, 88, <laughs> Hulk Hogan. <laughs> but like normal people aren't seeing Hulk Hogan and they're like, God damn, for some reason, I just really want to buy a fucking swastika right now. I don't know why, right? Like, Communities are turned, yeah. yeah. Communities are turned by problematic humor, and that's what should be focused on sometimes, not dog whistles. I, I'm, uh, I'm mostly with you there. I just sometimes worry that some of those things will slip through and muddy the waters again. But you, that's a good point that you made. It's like, what can you truly quantify? How much of your attention is being drawn off by that versus, and whether or not that even matters, whether or not that's even a, a significant draw on attention. So yeah, I, I agree with with the. Um, that not really being a strong you know detriment um, sure. um yeah anything else i don't know no i think i'm pretty much done. i just wanted to kind of solidify those earlier positions and kind of better understand where you're coming from with them and thank you for clarifying like what you were talking about with your platform because that was really important to me like where you were going with that um i think overall like I don't really care too much about the platforming, otherwise being aware of the risk. Mm -hmm. My main issue is, you know, people who are going to have these concerns, and I think they should be heard, and I think there needs to be uh, some attention to it, and why it is that other people who have more higher stakes with their, you know, with their backgrounds or their ethnicity, et cetera, are going to have some serious concerns and worry about whether or not you have those concerns in mind or just kind of overlooking them because you don't share those backgrounds okay so yeah well but anyways thank you for taking the time shout out to dgg and uh thank you for the hate raid Des destiny you you sent a hate raid after me you targeted me for harassment damn it no problem have fun <laughs> stay safe be careful everybody all right have a good night bye, bye. everybody f's in chat for gorbachev who is dead ripperino Hey, real quick. Oh, shit. You know what would be fun for you to do today? Um, what's that? You should go get Truth Social and um, like go through Trump's post because apparently he's been fucking unhinged for the last day. Okay, I'll do it at some point. All right, fine, bye. Bye. wrist wants to talk. Why don't you refine the kryptonite on world? Because I don't want to bring 50 million fucking machines to do it over here, rage shitter.